Well, let's move on to our next super special guest, Dr. Morgan, with a talk on nutritional supplements and osteoporosis. Dr. Morgan is the Emeritus Medical Director of the University of Alabama at Birmingham's Osteoporosis Prevention and Treatment Clinic and the current director of their bone densitometry service. She has degrees in food and nutrition and dietetics and food and nutrition and related science, finished medical school, internal medicine res uh, residency at the University of Iowa, received a clinical nutrition fellowship and a master's degree in clinical nutrition at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And she's a professor emeritus of medicine, nutritional sciences in the division of clinical immunology and rheumatology at UAB. Thank you for your time, Dr. Morgan. We are excited to have you here. You can go ahead and get started when you can. Thank you. I, I, I wanted to, I thought I had this set up to um, show you the um, ISCD atlas, but I think maybe in the, in the interest of time, I think maybe we'll just kind of go ahead with, um, with my, my lecture here. All right. Um, so I just, just tell you, there is a new um, DEXA atlas on the ISCD website. It's a member benefit. It's something I have been interested in for a long time. I think we are getting close to 200 cases there now. So I would really recommend that you check this out. We would love for people to submit cases. And uh, you'll see that we have a, a whole wealth of things about artifacts and positioning and analysis errors. It's also a good place for you to submit cases that are really badly done DEXs because I find those very useful in teaching. So um, I'm from UAB and we have a multidisciplinary uh, clinic. I think that being a dietitian, I think being having a multidisciplinary clinic has always been very important and osteoporosis is, as you all know, is a very multidisciplinary specialty. And so um, on a day that we have osteoporosis clinic, we have a physical therapist there, we have a patient educator. Um, we haven't been able to have the lunch during COVID, but uh, this is the way that we used to set up our clinic. We do have a website and we've set up a virtual classroom. Um, this just shows some of the things that, that we do in the clinic. And this is on our virtual uh, classroom. You can go to this link and we have some patient education materials. And so we ask our patients to look at these materials before they come to clinic. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, nutrition. And I think uh, being a dietitian all these years, um, it's really been interesting in all facets of, of medicine. You know, one time we have a positive study about a nutrient, another time we have a negative study. Lots of times it's, you know, equivocal. And so this is just another example of the Preventive Service Task Force recently re um, released some information related to vitamin and mineral supplements. And so some of the things were positive and some of them were negative. So one of the things I wanted to first talk about is why are nutrition uh, results so, so confusing? Um, and I'm going to refer to sort of one of my heroes, heroes in the field is uh, Bob Haney, who did a lot of this work. But basically the bottom line is, is that the use of evidence-based medicine and reliance upon randomized controlled trials probably doesn't make as much sense when we're looking <clears throat> at nutrition and any type of chronic disease, for example, bone. And some of the reasons are that um, for a nutrient to have an effect, it really has the best effect when you're treating a person that has inadequate nutritional status. When you're doing a drug study, you're not doing something that's caused by the absence of a drug. So, um, and a lot of the, the effects of nutrients are sort of within the noise of biological variability. So it can be very difficult, very challenging to study a nutrient and a chronic disease. This is a very important slide. It talks about um, how nutrient effects occur. They really occur as a sigmoid curve. So when you're deficient down at the bottom, you may take a lot of a nutrient to be able to have an effect. Uh, in the middle, you, you have an effect, but it's very important to look at C. This is when an individual is sufficient. And so if you have a person that is sufficient in a nutrient and you're doing a clinical trial and giving them the nutrient, you really don't, you're, you're really not going to see much of an effect. The, the, the effect that you might see is toxicity. So that's one of the things that we need to know about um, nutrients 
studies is what was the nutritional status of a patient when we started the clinical trial. And so he talks about the fact, once again, that a randomized controlled trial is probably not best suited for nutrition, nutrition uh, studies. Nutrient effects are polyvalent and nutrients affect you know, many tissues in, in the body and we have interactions between nutrients. So calcium and vitamin D is the one we think about a lot, but there's certainly some interesting data about protein intakes needing to be adequate for calcium to have an impact. So it's, it's these all these things need to be taken into account and oftentimes they're not taken into account. So once again, another reason that some of these studies are a little bit equivocal. Another um, issue is that different tissues can have different response curves. So depending on where you're measuring, it, 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 it may be shifted to the left or to the right. Another important thing about nutrients is the vista on which you do the clinical trial. Nutrient effects may take decades to be manifest. You know, um, when we, we talk about nutrients, sometimes we talk about, for example, lifetime intake of a nutrient like calcium. So when we're doing a clinical trial with a, with a drug, it can be a relatively short trial. But doing a relatively short trial, you know, six months or a year may not be adequate to find an effect uh, of, a, of a nutrient. So this just talks about this fact, uh, what Bob Haney talks about is he talks about latency. So, you know, with calcium, oxalate urolithiasis, this has a short latency, but something like osteoporosis has a long latency. With vitamin K, clotting disorders have a short latency, but perhaps osteoporosis and, and looking at vitamin K, maybe we need longer clinical, clinical trials if we're gonna see any type of an effect. So one of the things that we certainly see in the literature is the wonderful meta-analysis. And so everybody seems to take a meta-analysis to heart. But what Bob Haney says about this, and until we link outcomes to blood levels achieved and understand what analytic to measure meta-analyses will not answer how much is enough. And so I, I, I would just tell you when you're looking at you know, a meta-analysis related to nutritional status, think about some of these things. Did they know baseline nutritional status? How long was it? Um, and so um, there's many reasons when you look at a meta-analysis that things can be equivocal. This is my opinion for what it's worth is that I think in, in many areas of medicine, you know, we, we started out in the, you know, the glory days of nutrition, we started out with, you know, nutrient deficiencies, and we were able to look at, you know, nutrient deficiencies. But now I think that the pattern is evolving in nutritional studies, and probably rightly so, to look more at dietary patterns. After all, that's, that's what we do. We eat, we don't eat a single nutrient. Um, we eat, we do eat single nutrients, but we eat it in the context of, of diets. And so I think we'll be seeing a lot more related to dietary patterns um, and all sorts of, of medical disorders. It kind of brings us, I think, to this wonderful article in the New England Journal of Medicine, the, the Vital Study. And you know, this has gotten a lot of play where they talk about the fact that it did not result in significantly lower risk of fractures. And once again, this was among a healthy, a healthy population. Um, they, they did do some analysis based um, upon um, the initial vitamin, vitamin D level. Um, I think this was underpowered, but their, their take on this was that even in a deficient population, that vitamin D didn't do anything related to the fracture. And I'm sure many of you have have read this um, you know, editorial that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so once again, um, you know, pretty definitive that we should stop screening for vitamin D levels or recommending vitamin D supplements in the healthy population. What I would say is that I think you can go back and take some of the lessons of Bob Haney when you look at, at the, the vital study. Um, a, a large majority of the patients in the vital study had a very adequate vitamin 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. So would a response be expected? No. Um, 
once again, the, the, the follow-up uh, vitamin D level was at two years, the fractured data was over a longer period of time. So sort of a temporal inconsistency. Um, I'm not sure that they probably were able to evaluate, you know, things like protein intake and, and calcium and all those things related to vitamin D. I mentioned to you that there was a subgroup with a low vitamin D level. Um, once again, it was, I think it was 2000 IUs was the dosing adequate. We all know that when we have somebody that's very vitamin D deficient, we may need to use a, you know, a fairly large, large dose. And I would say that, 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 that segment was, was grossly underpowered. The other thing I would just ask you to think about is, is it really reasonable to expect a nutrient alone to have an effect on something like bone mineral density or fracture? You know, we know that the effects are sometimes within the noise of biological variation. And so to me, it's kind of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Even if I was able to, you know, do a, a, a good study and, you know, vitamin D, for example, didn't lower fracture risk, I don't think I would conclude that vitamin D is not important in bone health. So in, in last minutes remaining, I want to go on to a little bit about some of the, the nutrients and, and the supplements and things that we use in, in treating metabolic bone disease. The first I'll talk about is slow release calcium. And um, I'm sure a lot of your patients, a lot of my patients, um, you know, take this in. And this is just the, it's, it's a Citrical, um, Citrical product. Um, I have spent a lot of time calling Bayer and asking them for specific data about it. Um, you know, absorption studies to support or refute the usefulness of the product. I've done this probably over about a seven to 10 year period. And I have, even though they promised me that I'm, they're going to send things, I've never received anything. So I generally tell people that no more than five to 600 milligrams of calcium is absorbed at a time. And just because I don't have a lot of data, I have tended to shy away from this, this um, product. Now, once again, um, uh, I was able to talk to Bob Haney about this thing. And um, I'll just tell you what he said. You know, he said he had been contacted several times about a so-called delayed release approach to calcium supplementation. He said, it's my understanding that what one wanted was not delayed release in the sense that this term is usually used in medicine, but instead you'd want gastric retention. And he said that they showed it makes a huge difference in absorbability by the simple device of giving small doses repeatedly over a seven to eight hour period. So that's not, this is of course, literally slowed glass gastric release and not really what a lot of us think about in the, in the intestine of being delayed release. So I don't really know what the product does, but I, I kind of doubt that it does anything to gastric retention. So, um, when I talked to Bob about this many times, he didn't have any data. And um, until they can give me some data, I'm, I'm very interested to know how they're saying that it's a delayed release product. Um, another um, product that was out there for a long time was calcium um, plus genistein. And the impetus for this occurring was that there is a something called a medical food that's called fostium, which contains genistein. Now, this is a, a, a paper that I wrote about uh, medical foods. Medical foods are sort of halfway between dietary supplements and drugs. And there is a, the medical food, um, there's all sorts of uh, regulations about medical foods. You use it to sort of treat the dietary, um, the metabolic effects related to a, a, a chronic disease. Um, and so because there is the medical food fostium, and there is data from Italy that sh it was done in an osteopenic population that it can inc increase bone mineral density. Well, the, the manufacturer said, well, let's just, let's add genistein to, you know, to Citrical. And this is going to be, you know, pretty much similar to the, the medical food, the, the fostium. Um, well, actually, just to make a very long story short, um, the manufacturers of fostium, and, and they were involved in this study, actually did a, a, a clinical trial between the fostium and the citricale plus the genistein. And so they had the medical food and then they had the over-the-counter um, supplement. You can sort of see what the what was was in it. It has the 
the same amount of the genistein, um, which is a, you know, a phytoestrogen. It does have some calcium in it. But the, the bottom line here is that the genistein from the supplement, from the over-the-counter, had a lower overall uptake than, than the fostium. And they, they, if you read the paper, they talk about the effect that probably the, the calcium that they used and other things in the formulation are going to affect the pharmacokinetics. So what that says to me is that if you're going to use a medical food, you need to know about it. And you can't always conclude that just putting something like genistein in a supplement is going to do the same as the, the medical food. So a medical food is based upon established science. And there's no requirement for this for a dietary supplement. So you can't always conclude that the dietary supplement has a similar effect as a medical food. So if you're going to use some of these types of preparations, it's important to ask questions and know that they, they actually do the same thing. I'll finish off here with Algecal and strontium supplements. Of course, strontium is in the same column of the periodic elements under calcium, so it's heavier than calcium. And the whole reason that people started wanting to put strontium once again in calcium supplements was because of the strontium renolate and that the usefulness. Now, of course, this is no longer used in Europe, but still that doesn't stop people here in the United States from wanting to put strontium in, in calcium supplements. You remember from this very nice paper that because strontium is heavier, what it's gonna do is gonna have a physical effect. It's gonna be a corp incorporated in the hydroxyapatite and it's gonna increase bone mineral density just because it's heavier than calcium. So there's all of these, these, these products. I've, I've, I've gone round and round over the years with the Algecal um, uh, people asking them questions about it. You know, they keep on sending me all of these old papers from 2007. And, um, but, but I think you all know, and you have these patients. I mean, I have patients that's, that swear by this. And generally because of the strontium, they'll improve bone mineral density, but I can't tell them that they're having any fracture reduction. And, you know, just look at the website. I mean, they have some really um, interesting statements that they make about some of these supplements that contain, you know, strontium. You know, most calcium supplements can increase bone mineral density, this one does. And so these are just the papers that they will they will talk about, about the effectiveness of the calcium with the strontium. This was an open label study. Um, and you can see that there were three different plans, plan one, plan two, plan three. Plan three was, a supple was the supplement that actually did not contain the strontium. But what was I found interesting here in the clinical trial that the largest increases in bone mineral density occurred in plan three rather than plan one or plan two. So this is counterintuitive to me because the strontium is going to be incorporated and that should be increased bone mineral density. So this doesn't really, to me, support the usefulness. There are a couple of other studies that you know, have been done. This is one that they talk about. It was a seven-year longitudinal trial. And once again, um, they, they added strontium. And what they did is they, the red line here, this was their um, trend of their annual increase in bone mineral density. And then they used an age match control group. They didn't really have a control group. And they sh their, their, their conclusion was that, of course, the group that used the strontium went up, whereas the age match control group went down. So, you know, they, they concluded that, that, that the strontium supplement in and of itself was obviously much better, you know, than, than doing nothing. This was something called the, the COMB trial. It was done in individuals who declined or failed drug therapy. And uh, once again, um, the, the clinical protocol Added, added strontium. And uh, once again, they did some kind of interesting things here. They, they, they looked at the increases at the femoral neck, the total hip, the total spine. They compared it to strontium renolate. They compared it to alendronate and they compared it to residronate. I mean, you know, these were different trials. And so I don't think that these are, are reasonable um, you know, reasonable comparisons. But once again, when you just look at the numbers, it makes it look like 
wow, this, you know, strontium supplement is, is, is much better than a lendronate or residronate at, at, at one year. So there were a lot of limitations that I found to these, um, you know, uh, uh, clinical trials. So um, once again, strontium by its physical effect can increase bone mineral density, but I don't think we know anything about fracture reduction. I can tell you that they will never do fraction reduction trials with a, with a nutritional supplement. So my bottom line on these is that there's no long-term studies related to efficacy safety. It confounds the DEXA. And generally there can be side effects. I've had patients with side effects on these supplements. So I generally tend to dissuade my patients from using these though. Over the years, I certainly have had some people that you know, swear by these things and um, you know, I've just tended to follow them. So with that, I hope I stayed on, on track and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Rowan, this is Joe, can, can I ask a question? Please. So um, that was great, Sarah. Um, I really appreciate it. So I have a question about the strontium and then another question. My, because of the European stuff with the cardiovascular safety, I have been telling my patients that they shouldn't take it, that, that, that I'm concerned about its danger um, in absence of strong, any efficacy data on strontium citrate. So that's just, I'll ask you to comment on that. The other question is, how about K2? Um, so I, I totally agree with you. Like I said, there have, there have been long, no long-term studies. I, you know, I don't know to what extent the Algecal people, um, you know, look at that. I mean, that's, a, that's a real problem with a nutritional supplement, but I, I'm not sure I've seen anything reported. You know, it, it is, it is a, it is a different salt citrate, you know, and, and, and if you go into the Algecal stuff, they make a lot about the fact they're using citrate instead of the renolate. So, but I totally, I totally agree with you. And I, I think there's many reasons that I, I tend to not um, um, recommend it to my patients. What about K2? Uh, well, I think we should ask Neil, but, um, you know, I, I, there's, there's, there, there have been no, you know, clinical trials yet, which have, you know, definitively shown anything related to bone mineral density or um, our fracture reduction. Once again, I guess I, you know, um, once again, I would ask the question, I mean, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's going to be difficult to, to show that noise within the biological variability, and maybe we need a much longer um, you know, clinical trial. You know, the other thing when I think about vitamin K, um, you know, we, we all make vitamin K in our colon and it probably refluxes back up through the ileal cecal valve into the small bowel. So, you know, how many of us are truly vitamin K deficient? I mean, you know, if we're on, if we're on Coumadin or if we're on broad spectrum antibiotics, then yes. But, um, you know, you know, perhaps it's going to be very tough to, to show that. All right, we have a question from L. Fitton. Why did they stop using strontium in Europe? It was, was cardiovascular, um, myocardial infarction and cardiovascular problems. And is that something you tell your patients, Dr. Morgan? About, about the fact that strontium is no longer used in Europe? Yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. And, you know, I mean, even even when they they talked about it in Europe, it, it was very it was pretty clear that they weren't going to do any clinical trials in the United States. So, all right. Any other questions for Dr. Morgan? Well, thank you, Dr. Morgan. Very informative, um, very helpful, and very relevant to practically every patient that we see.